So uh, PA is always going to be correct for the last example it's seen, but of course it's not always going to be correct for all the examples that it's seen. Right? So uh, if you want that, if you want guarantees like that, use a support vector machine. It won't scale to Twitter, but uh, you will get, uh, you do get predictions. Uh, so you do get guarantees on predictions. So uh, when you when you build a support vector machine, you basically um, you specify a set of conditions that you want to get satisfied, right? So for all the positive documents, you want the scores to be greater than one, not just for the last one that you've seen like NPA, but for everything that's positive, right? So uh, you want all the scores to be bigger than 0.1, right? So you want something like that. So if that's 0.1, all the positives are above that. For all negatives, they're smaller than minus one. Um, and then, subject to those constraints, you try to maximize the separation between the positives and the negatives. And in an SVM, it turns out that that is equivalent to minimizing the size of the weight vector. Right. So uh, now that's a condition that whenever I, whenever uh, it used to be that whenever I heard it, I said it's like why, you know, why, how is it related? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give a bit of an intuition for uh, for the relationship there. Now. Um, that is a complicated problem. Uh, there is no simple algorithm for solving it. There are multiple optimizations uh, uh, that have to take place, and there are many algorithms that do it. And basically, what all of them do is they come up with a solution that has the following form. And this form is kind of interesting. <coughs> uh, so uh, for now, just accept it. But in a minute, you, you're going to see why exactly it has this uh, form. So the weight vector has the following form. So it's the sum of all the positive examples, right? You take the vector that corresponds to the positive example, put some weight lambda, oh, alpha j on it, right? And that, that is a positive weight. Uh, add them up so you get some sort of a vector. And here, you're doing the same thing with the negative. Now, if you compare this to what we saw two slides back with a centroid, this is almost a centroid, right? So how would this become a centroid? This would be a centroid if alpha j was 1 over the number of positives, and if this alpha j was 1 over the number of negatives. Then you would just get a centroid of positives and a centroid of negatives. So that's the analogy to the centroid. Now what is different here? What's different is you actually have these weights. right? So uh, what this means is you are giving more weight to some documents, you're giving more credit to some documents and less credit to um, other documents. And it also turns out that most of the alpha j's are going to be zero, so most of the documents don't matter. So the only ones that matter are actually um, the ones that, the ones that the, are on the boundary. That's, 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 what, that's, what, that's what the theory claims, right? <clears throat> uh, and that means you have a sparse solution, so you could potentially throw away all of these guys, throw away all of those guys, and your decision boundary is just defined by the nearest documents. Right. So it's kind of related to the centroid classifier, only it has weights on the, vid on the individual documents. And it's all about how you learn those weights. Now, um, whenever, uh, whenever I saw that uh, formulation, it was always confusing to me why exactly things like that. Right. So why are you minimizing the size of the weight vector? How is that related to the size of the margin? And why on earth does the final solution have this centroid-like form? Why does it look like that? Um, and um, you can, um, I guess, so um, you, you can plow it through it the formal way, right? And uh, so if you, look at, if you look at lecture slides for intro to machine learning, you'll have a long way of getting to that solution. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to give just a little bit of intuition for why these things arise, and why, why, why it happens to be that way. And for this, we're going to need a notion of a polytope, right, or a convex, uh, a convex hull around the positives and the negatives. So the best way to think about it is um, uh, imagine that I have, so in 2D, imagine that I have a rubber band, and I'm going to put a rubber band around the negatives, and I'm going to put a round, rubber band around the positives. Right. So uh, that's what the rubber band would look like when wrapped around the negatives, and that's what it would look like when wrapped around the positives. And if you're in multi-D, just imagine that I'm wrapping a rubber, rubber sheet around the set of positives and the set of uh, negatives. So that's what a polytope is. It's basically a line. Uh, it's, it's, it's a set in space that's defined by the corner points. <clears throat> now, one interesting thing about the polytope is any point in the polytope is a linear combination of other points. 
And you should be able to see that clearly, right? So say I'm on this line, right? Any point on this line is a linear combination of this positive example and that positive example, right? So for example, this point in the middle, that's just the average of the top and the bottom. And any other point on the line is a weighted combination of those two, right? And you can make the same argument for every edge of the polytope. And then, if I'm asking about this point, well, how do I get that point? That's easy. You know, I find, uh, so uh, I take this point, and I find that point, which is a linear combination of this guy and that guy. And now this guy is a linear combination of this point and that point. So every point in the polytope is a linear combination of other points uh, in the polytope. Uh, and in fact, you can represent everything as just the set of uh, linear combinations of corners. Right? So in general, it's going to look like that. Any point H in the polytope is a mixture of documents in the polytope uh, of the corners uh, weighted by some weights uh, alpha H, D. Right? So is that totally obvious? Okay. So be true, it's totally obvious because it's not. You're not, you're not going to get the next stuff. <clears throat> okay, so now I have my two polytopes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find the two nearest points, two points on the two polytopes that are closest to each other, right? So what are they? From the positive polytope, it's kind of easy. This guy is closer to, to, the, to the negative polytope than anything else, right? So, so this, is the close, this is the positive point H that is closest to the negative polytope. Now, for the negative one, it's a little bit more complicated. It's not one of the corners. It's not any of the existing documents. It's actually a point right there. And by the way, when I mean closest, all I'm looking for is I'm looking for two points. Imagine that I have two sliding points, and I put a spring between them. Right? It's going to settle to a certain point, and it's going to settle to this point right there. This, this negative point and this positive point are closer to each other than any other points in the polytopes. <clears throat> right? So, Again, nice and simple. Now I'm going to claim some interesting things. I'm going to claim that the margin, the buffer zone between the positives and the negatives, cannot be any bigger than the difference between the positive and the negative. Is that obvious? Right. If it was any bigger, it wouldn't fit, because those two points would pr protrude. Okay. Now, I'm also going to claim that the buffer zone cannot be a, should not be any smaller than that distance. Is that totally obvious? Because if it were any smaller, I could increase it, and I still wouldn't be touching any of the points. Okay? So it cannot be any bigger. It shouldn't be any smaller. So the margin must be exactly the difference between the positive and the negative point, h plus and h minus. <clears throat> Can you guys still see that? Is the, is the light OK? I just can't tell because it's shining in my eyes. All right. Uh, so the buffer zone must be somewhere in there. Now, another thing that I'm going to claim is uh, the boundary must be halfway along this line, along the line con uh, connecting h plus and h minus. And is that obvious? So it must pass through that point, right? And it must actually be perpendicular to that line, because that's the only way I can maintain the margin at that size. If the boundary goes any other way, my margin would have to be smaller, right? The only way to maintain the margin of this size is to have it perpendicular to the line that goes between the two closest points, right? So my, uh, my boundary has to be like that, right? Now, look at the, this is my decision boundary, has to be like that. What is the vector that's perpendicular to it? The vector that's perpendicular to it is the distance line between the positives and negatives, right? So the distance line between the positives and the negatives, it's a vector, and I can represent it in that form. Why? Because h plus was a linear combination of points in the positive set h minus was a linear combination of points in the negative set. So the line that connects them must have this form, the vector that connects them. And that is a vector that is perpendicular to the decision boundary. And that, is the, that must be the weight vector, because the weight vector is perpendicular to the 
decision boundary. Okay, fine. So we've explained that stuff. Now you know why the SVM solution has exactly this form. Uh, now, why are you minimizing W? Uh, well, that turns out uh, it comes directly out of this. I was looking for two points, H plus and H minus, which are closest to each other. Right. So I'm looking, I'm, when I'm searching for H plus and H minus, I'm minimizing the distance between them. And the distance between them is exactly the size of the weight vector. Right. So if you're trying to make sense of the support vector machines, uh, uh, I find that this way of thinking uh, between them gives a lot more intuition than sort of the standard derivation. So, so that's a useful thing. Right, so that's, a, that's an SVM. Now, thankfully, uh, I guess you should never try to implement an SVM yourself, right? Just, just use one of the packages. There's plenty of libraries. SVM Lite is a good one. 